my gosh, I get a hand mic, which feels very fancy. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. This is a great turnout, and rightfully so, I think. Uh, so welcome to the second lecture of the day in the last Mellon Sawyer seminar series here at the University of Iowa. Uh, as many have, of you have already experienced, uh, there's been a brilliant array of researchers, scholars, and, of course, teachers that have graced our campus over the past few months. And Professor Eric Quackel, who we have welcomed to campus today, only adds to this really stellar lineup. He is an incredibly learned uh, and accomplished scholar, and so I really had to pick through and choose only a few things out of his impressive 31-page resume. <laughs> First, as someone who has indeed introduced a lot of people in her day, uh, 31 pages holds the record, so you got a, a new title to add. Uh, and uh, unequivocally, this is, is one of the most uh, learned people that, that I really have ever had the pleasure uh, to introduce to a crowd. And he really can back it up. Professor Quackel is now a full professor and the Scalinger, Scalinger Chair of the Study and Promotion of Special Collections at Leiden University. The honor of full professor is a rare and coveted one in Holland and really throughout Europe. In addition to this position, he is a tenured university docent at Leiden University Center for the Arts. Before coming back to Leiden, which granted him his PhD in 2002, he held positions at the University of Victoria and the University of British Columbia in Canada. Moreover, a look at his awards and honors reveals that Professor Kwaka has an array of print and digital projects in the works. He was awarded a grant by the KNAW Young Academy for, the, for his Hidden Library project and was also an E.A. Lowe Fellow at Corpus Christi College at Oxford University. Additionally, <laughs> uh, additionally, BuzzFeed named him one of the eight book historians with the most impact in the same year. He currently has two monographs, one on books before the printing press, and another on the birth of Gothic script, and one edited volume, which is on the vernacular manuscript. All three of these are just in preparation for publication. But also, in addition, he has written numerous monographs, articles, and journal contributions and chapters on medieval authorship, the emergence of paper, medicinal training in medieval Italy, and many other titles regarding 12th century book culture. Yet, in addition to all of these amazing publications and monographs, he also finds the time to write the most popular blog on medieval books that currently exists on the internet, and thus really has ever existed. This is called medievalbooks.nl. So I've put the hyperlink there if you want to go see it. Uh, it has over 50 posts on the subject of medieval books and is still growing. Additionally, he has over 18,000 Twitter followers and 250 Tumblr posts. This is not to impress you with the numbers of people that follow him on Twitter. It is just to say that in addition to being an incredible uh, person in terms of publication and learned about medieval manuscripts, he finds the time always, from what I've seen on Twitter over the past few years, to speak to students, teachers, but also the general public to make medieval manuscripts accessible. Uh, when I started off blogging, Professor Quackel asked me if I wanted to do a guest post for him, and this greatly helped me get my own readership for my blog. He's never too busy to talk to people who know nothing about Latin and nothing about the medieval book about what our job entails, and that really is why he is the example to me and many others of the public academic and the public historian uh, that we all want to be. So, without further ado, I will uh, bring up Professor Quackel to talk to us today about Aristotle and the Medieval University, the birth of a new book format. You're, you're on the PC? Well, thanks, Sarah, for this very, um, very nice introduction. Uh, the picture made me look like 10 years younger, even though it was only five years ago. Uh, <laughs> I think it's because of my um, I don't know, red cheeks and uh, youthful sweater. I'm, I'm more appropriately dressed, uh, dressed today. I'm, I'm extremely happy to be here. 
um, in Iowa and the Midwest. Uh, I love coming to the States uh, to do papers. It's an extremely pleasant and uh, entertaining but also a challenging environment where people are willing to learn about medieval books and sort of sit back and enjoy, but also have critical questions. So I love that um, sort of dynamic in which both things are interwoven. And um, since this is research that is still in the making that I'm presenting today, it's probably you can enjoy, but also be very critical. And I uh, welcome both um, dynamics. Yeah, I'm going to take you into the medieval classroom and look at the books that were used in this environment. I'm, I'm not saying that were used on the table, even though you see them on the table, because I think there's something to be said for medieval classrooms without books on the table, um, but we'll get to that. Um, I'm interested to look how one particular type of text, namely works by Aristotle, were used in various environments, in first the monastic school, and then in the university environment. And this is um, sort of an interesting way of doing what is a main thread in the lectures this year here. That is to see how something developed. And in my experience, uh, the best way to, to track how over time books develop is to look at a certain text and follow that same text in various stages of use. And if you do this well with, with sufficient number of anchor points, uh, in time, uh, geographically, um, various types of books with the same text. You get a good sense of what people wanted with this text in different ages, how they adopted the material for their own uh, needs, and also how they um, adapted it if necessary. So all that will be um, sort of uh, on the table today. And uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting slides, a lot of bookish slides, and if it, if it goes like the previous speaker, we'll have a lot of things to talk about after as well. Um, my work is showing, I'm trying to show anyway, that there is a strong relationship between the physical appearance of the book on the one hand and the manner in which the object was used. And this may seem like a you know, straightforward uh, thing to, to assume, but it's not always the case. Um, but for the Middle Ages it is, I think, and um, not always evenly strong in all periods in the Middle Ages. But this, um, for the period that we're looking at here, which is sort of the 13th century, and particularly for classroom use, there is a very strong relationship between the manner in which the text used in a classroom situation was presented on the page and the manner in which this text was actually used in that setting. And so I'm going to look at some paleographical features and some chronological features and contrast that with monastic schools. And then we have a good sense of how the book developed, in this case, uh, Aristotle, from the monastic school to the university and uh, why that may be. Why, not why it evolved, but uh, why it evolved in a way that I'm going to show you. There is a, a notion that I talked about yesterday, which is uh, cultural residue, which is that certain features in the manuscript are reflective of the manner in which the book was used, but also the background of the reader, and sometimes even the background of the scribe, which is a wonderful uh, principle if you want to deduce something from an existing manuscript in front of you in the library, even though you don't know anything about the book. So by looking at the physical traits, codicological, paleographical, you get a sense often about what a reader wanted. And this is one of the main things behind um, the talk today. It's sort of the uh, overarching umbrella, even though I won't highlight it explicitly because I did it yesterday. But that's sort of uh, the baseline behind uh, many of the slides and, and features, manuscript features that I'm going to show you. And this, of course, is because the medieval manuscript is a unique object. That is to say, it was made for one person by one person. And while a printer is also one person making a book, it wasn't meant for one person because there's a 1,000 readers, uh, or 500, or 2,000, however many this printer printed. Um, and therefore, and this is also what I've shown yesterday, you can't really draw this connection between reader, the unique first reader of a printed book, and the printer sending out this book with certain features because he imagined that this particular reader would read the book. With the manuscript, you can. Um, arguably, the medieval scribe knew exactly who his reader was, not exceptionally, but as a rule. There's, in fact, very few exceptions you can think of where this is not the case, which means that every book that we consult in the library today 
um, was targeted for a particular reader, the first reader, either the scribe himself or a fellow monk in a monastery or in another institution, or uh, if it's a commercial scribe, somebody who paid for this book um, in a commercial setting. In all cases, the scribe knew what the reader wanted, and since the book was so expensive and so took so long to make, one may assume, and this is a jump, but I think a, a, a likely one, that the scribe would have listened carefully what the reader wanted. And this is sort of the starting point for our story because it means that what we see now in a manuscript is not only interesting because it shows you cultural background, etc., the things I just told you about, but also we can really tie it to the reader. This is somebody, uh, this is something, a feature, that one particular person wanted. So if we can assume where this person was situated, in our case it's the school class, classroom or classroom environment, broadly speaking, education. Um, we can then say, well, why did this person, and if you look at multiple of the same manuscripts at the same time, which is what I'm doing, why did these people all across Europe want these particular features? And if you do them that way, the manuscript comes to life, the manuscript surviving today, um, and becomes a real tool of investigating broader cultural intellectual phenomena in medieval society, in our, in our case in uh, education. So we will go, ultimately, after a start somewhere else, to the Faculty of Arts, which is where um, there is a lot of reading going on, and uh, there's, a, there's a good picture here. Um, but it all sort of gravitates around one particular uh, book, and that is the Corpus Vetustius. And this is um, sort of to show you that books, of course, are important for education now, but also in the past. And there's evidence in, in all sorts of uh, ways that people actually use these. But it's evidence like this on the seal of Paris University that show you how people interacted. So we see at the front um, of the seal, um, teachers, I think, on the top left, consulting books, perhaps writing lectures or studying. With the lower two fields, you see people interacting in discussion with books on the table. And especially the gesture uh, like this in the lower right means discussion. I pose this and I, uh, I disagree. So, so there's, there's uh, discussions going on, but books are on the table. And in the arts faculty then, it was the Corpus Vetustius that was on the table. This is the, the, the most important textbook, standard textbook for the arts faculty. And of course, of course uh, arts uh, back then in the medieval period was something that everybody would do before you would wonder about and do other things. So even as a medical student, a law student, you would all start in the art, all start in the art faculty, uh, six years, and everybody then that went to university would read from this book, that is uh, the Corpus Vitusius, the older corpus, which is a number of texts by Aristotle, um, natural philosophy, nine at least, but up to 25 in some cases, also pseudo-Aristotelian pseudo and sometimes even commentaries in the same binding, but at least at the core, a number of texts by Aristotle. It didn't start like that. So this book I just showed you. So the text you see here is, it's a very busy text. There's a lot of things happening. There is the main text in the middle. There's uh, lots of space for um, commentary around it. In fact, there are glosses surrounding the main text. But there's all sorts of um, tools on the page that I will talk about later that help the reader do a certain thing. So it's a busy page interaction reader while he consumed um, the material as he was reading the material. But when we start looking at where I want to start, which is the environment before the university, that is the monastic school. There's, uh, there's other educational uh, centers, for example, the cathedral school is of course very important because that is the precursor of the university. But I'm more interested now in the monastic school because there is a lot of interest also uh, in Aristotle and other classical texts for the study of grammar and rhetoric and dialectics. So in that environment, we have um, a classroom setting. And this is a, a little bit of a um, not a correct depiction, I think, but I like it because it, sh it shows a Hugh of St. Victor. And of course, he's a very important uh, scholar. And I like his works and his manuscripts as well. Um, we see Hugh teaching in his hand, holding a manuscript that has a sort of peculiar shape. It looks somewhat longish. Um, one of the students in front of him also has one of those uh, longish uh, books. And um, if you look more carefully, then you'll see these tall manuscripts um, quite a bit um, being used in education 
in the monastic schools in Europe. So what's going on? Well, as a starting point, I'd like to take uh, this example, which is from uh, this Sangal uh, collection, the wonderful manuscript uh, collection of Sangal, uh, manuscript 833, which was produced in Italy circa 1100. And there's a note in front which says this was used by four teachers. And then the, the names were mentioned. And this is a note uh, very early 12th century, so around the time when the manuscript was made, perhaps a few decades later. So this is a textbook, um, Porphyry's uh, Isagoge, which is an introduction to Aristotle's ca categories, and uh, a very popular textbook for logic. And then this was in the classroom in Singal, um, where people were not reading from it, because only the teacher was reading from it. And that's the crux, what we're talking about now. That is, in a monastic classroom, there is no dialogue between class and teacher, which is something that we will see uh, it's quite frequent and normal in, in the university environment. But it's the teacher that's holding a copy, and it's the students that are listening and are responding to queries and uh, have things to, to debate themselves and perhaps also write down. The teacher moves through the room, um, has no fixed desk in front of him. That's very clear from uh, this image, right? So it's in his hand, there's no desk, probably because he wants to move about. So this longish manuscript um, I've gathered about 80 of them for um, a study into why this tall page. It's so unusual. And especially so because we have indications that in the period itself, people looked at this page and actually remarked in the same way as I do now, there, it's very unusual and tall. So this does not have the right size, is uh, what a, a librarian in Utrecht uh, remarks on. It's too, it's too narrow. So if you look at these narrow manuscripts and you measure them, then you quickly see that they have um, a height of 1, so 100% height. And the width might be as little as 30% uh, 30 30 of the height, so 0 0.3, or 0 0.5, or 0 0.55, or 6, but not the usual medieval formula, which is 0 0.7. So the normal proportions of the medieval page, and this is quantitative study of uh, thousands of manuscripts, not by me, has, has shown that. Um, is 1 by 0 0.7, which is basically what we have today, what we have today in Europe, because uh, North America, the paper is a little bit different, as you might know. So if you, if you print out something that you made here, you, you, you're not in trouble when you go from, from North America but to Europe, but the other way around, then you're, you're in trouble because there's no more paper and there's still text to print. So in the medieval period, generally speaking, and here we are, uh, the numbers are far over 90%, is 0 0.7 wide. When it's narrow, people start to remark, this is weird, it's too narrow, and actually we have very few. So if you put them in a database, which is what I did, and I think that's a good answer to any question you have uh, as a scholar today, is create a database. The previous lecture also mentioned it. And uh, I'm, I don't have the patience to do 5,000, 6,000 manuscripts, but 80 or 100 or perhaps even 500, it's doable. You know, it takes a few months, and then you can, you can wait until something comes out and then do your, do your work. Uh, don't peek yet at the data, just you know, well, you can start thinking a little bit brewing in your head. But if you do this with these narrow manuscripts, there's a few things coming out. One is um, that it's uh, indeed very rare. It takes a long time to find them until you know what's in them, and then it's very easy. But if you want a random sample, it takes a long time. Um, but then also, there is three categories, basically, um, and I've discussed yesterday briefly, but I'll be even briefer today. That is, um, some of them have uh, ivory cuttings. And that, of course, makes the book narrow because that means that the entire front or back or both uh, can be covered because the task of the elephants only has a certain width and therefore the book is adopted uh, to that, so adapted in narrowness to that uh, width of the tusk or of the ivory tablet plate. The other group is um, our manuscripts that are handheld and used in the service, the mass. And this is a good example. Um, um, here, where you see um, a very peculiar shape, very tall, 0.3 wide. Uh, that means that 30% um, of the height is the width, which is uh, most unusual. One of the smallest ones, narrowest ones that I know. There's one more narrow than that, that but it doesn't fit in this paper, so we'll leave that. Um, but you can see that this is something that could be taken out of a box, held in the hand of the soloist, and the soloist could even move through the church, which actually was um, uh, supposed to happen. There's, a, there's an odd experience. If you look at these uh, narrow manuscripts, 
And uh, in some cases, you can still do that because there are narrow, ma narrow manuscripts that have no binding. It's easy to, well, this is not something I've done, of course, squeeze them and um, um, hold them in your hands. They sort of curl up naturally. You can imagine if you take a pile of printed papers that you can do this and you can actually, maybe not a good example because it's the right proportions, but <laughs> you see what I mean. You can move about and it won't fall from your hand. This was the purpose of uh, this particular copy and it's also seen similarly in other copies used in the service. So Cantatoria, all Cantatoria pre-1200 are in what we call a holster format. So it has nothing to do with real holsters, but that these, these books, these narrow books, happen to have this name, unfortunately. And it's hard to erase, so I'm just going to use it and confirm it even further. Similarly, all the Tropers, another book uh, used by um, uh, in, the, in the mass, were also pre-1200, all in this holster format. So all breaking with the rules of having a proper 0.7 width. The rationale behind these service books is actually why um, I put them here, because it is the next step. Um, when we make the next step to teaching, you see what's going on. It's similarly handheld. So the, the main upside of having a narrow format is that it moves the weight, the pressure, from the fingertips to the palm of the hand, thus uh, allowing you to hold it without having to do anything else. You can imagine if you take a broad uh, art book that is uh, very broad and heavy, that the middle comes up, whereas if you have a narrow book yourself, some, some of these notebooks, um, the pressure goes to the palm of the hand, and it's much easier to stand there for a few hours, as sometimes happened in a church. But similarly, um, as it al also happened in the classroom. So the classroom use um, is actually uh, peculiarly narrow. Um, the textbooks used for the monastic schools. And here's just a sampler of, um, of various texts, in this case all classical, because if you look at the contents of these narrow books and they're not made for service use, they're not made for ivory uh, decoration in the bindings, um, you end up with 40% of the corpus um, classical texts, 50% if you expand it to other known teaching texts, um, for example, in medical uh, sciences. You end up with uh, about half of the corpus is made for educational use. So there's a clear link between education, monastic school, 11th, 12th centuries. In the 13th century, it's gone. This narrow <coughs> format is hardly seen anymore. Um, and um, the contents um, of the works also being for educational purposes. So I, I really love this slide because it's uh, uh, for a book historian, it's really shocking to see this, because sometimes you have one example of a, of a narrow book, but to see a whole splash on one, sh on one uh, slide really is very, it's quite telling. The other feature of um, Aristotle and other classical texts used in the monastic school is um, that it's a very straightforward, straightforward layout. There's no fancy things going on. Uh, you can see it on these. Uh, it's just a straightforward text, but also if you zoom in on one, so here's the, the Porphyry again, the category uh, introduction that I mentioned before. You actually, just, it's just a splash of text. There is no attempt made to say, well, this is important, and here starts one, and here is two, and here is the next paragraph. I put a nice, uh, you know, big fat paragraph sign next to it. All that doesn't happen. So, so we'll see it later in the university classroom, but this is to underscore that in the monastic classroom, uh, these features were not seen yet. And in fact, in many Carolingian manuscripts, these are not seen, because it's also a matter of progress, um, which is a theme that runs through these seminars, um, that a number of things still had to be invented, tools that help the reader. So the things that I'll show you later on the pages of the Aristotle manuscripts at university have things that did not exist yet around 1100, when um, these texts were used in a classroom of the monastery but also uh, things <coughs> that did exist were not applied. So some of the uh, reading aids that I'll show you later did exist in the Carolingian age, but was sort of used every now and then, maybe in a single, uh, one, one particular feature was used, but not as a bundle. So the real change that you will see from here is the inclusion in the later stage at the university of reading aids that are coming in a package. And, you'll, and I'll try to deduce why <coughs> the particular features that you see emerging as a bundle uh, appear as a bundle. But before I do that, I want to briefly um, take you to the edge of Europe in the 12th century, because then in the 12th century something happens to Aristotle 
and uh, that culminates into a new format that starts to emerge in the last quarter of the 12th century and that slowly starts to keep on developing until by the middle of the 13th century there's a standard package arrived and ready and it first um, is being applied on a massive scale in the Corpus Vetustius Aristotle manuscripts. So as Europe was changing, because of course you know that the 12th century is an a very, very exciting age for intellectual history and cultural history. Um, because um, for one, and this is important for us, there's an enormous effort made to translate text from Arabic, um, Greek text, originally Greek text often, but come to us um, through Arabic and then Latin. Um, and this happened in Spain, Italy, and a few other places. And you see even that as Western intellectuals run to uh, the south of Spain to try to to learn the language, Arabic, and then start to translate. Often with uh, intermediaries, people, most Arabs who knew both languages, um, perhaps even Jewish and Spanish um, uh, interpreters. But the fact is that a lot of Western Latin intellectuals stayed there for a long time, systematically uh, translating scientific and other knowledge um, into the uh, language of the West, Latin. It happened here in Cordoba. And um, we have evidence of libraries here being on an enormous size, um, uh, libraries with a total of 20,000 uh, volumes, where uh, compared um, a monastic library in this period, so we're talking about 12th century, early 12th century, may have 400, 500. So there's a very different approach in the East towards knowledge and dissemination, this personal, than we have in the West. We, in the West, have the urge to be better at it, and therefore we go to places like Cordoba. But uh, the, the fact is that it's going slowly. Nevertheless, there's people there translating on a massive scale. And uh, the other place where this happens is Toledo, and especially at the cathedral, where there's even at some stage in the 12th century uh, support from the church for this. So the uh, archbishop is, um, is supporting the, uh, it's not archbishop, the, the bishop of Toledo is supporting uh, translators who are even physically present in the cathedral. And so a very interesting thing happens here where East meets West on Western ground, on religious uh, uh, Christian uh, grounds, whereas in other places in Europe, um, very different things happen between these two uh, peoples, if you see what I mean. So it's the time of the Crusades as well. And so there goes, um, for example, all my guests uh, from Greek into Hebrew and then ultimately into Latin. And uh, I, could, uh, simply, I could show you another 20, 30 slides of texts, very important texts that, that are being used uh, 50 years later, uh, 100 years later at the medieval universities, but basically it all come down to this. It's an, uh, often a Greek origins, but it's translated from Arabic into Latin and then used in, in the classroom. So I, I really like this one because it shows you um, Aristotle um, it's sort of a, from an Arab, Arabic point of view. Um, one particular uh, person that is of importance is uh, Jared of Cremona, who translates over 70 large, uh, largely scientific works. And just to show you the, the, the problems that these people had, um, this phrase, quot esquia, and the cause is, is something that he uses all the time um, because it's so complicated that it's easier just to, to grab this uh, sort of gimmick phrase and, and then you know what I mean. You sort of, the, so the text is littered with this phrase. And, they, they, they can actually re uh, recognize uh, Cremona from it. And um, he, one of his uh, translations on the heavens, this one, is also part of the Corpus Vetustius. So this is often also a good way to see um, where the translations, the Aristotle translations in the Corpus manuscripts come from, who made them, who made them and where they originate in Europe. These texts then, ultimately ended up in the medieval classroom. And here they had um, sort of a very interesting um, purpose. And to show you that, I'm going to first talk a little bit about what actually these texts did. It's a, it's a little bit of a bummer, but Aristotle wasn't used in the classroom because they really liked Aristotle. It's be because his works provided information in a certain format that was very useful for the main purpose of university education, that is to train people 
in dialectics and uh, teach them to argue. Teach them to read carefully because you can only know the truth if you read carefully and understand the argument was the idea. So dialectics, um, for example, um, uh, Aristotle's topics uh, was used for that. And uh, the idea was that if you read the text very carefully, which was the first stage, the, the uh, reading of the litera, so the basic text, and then the teacher started to expound the text, um, broke it up into smaller bits and pieces, started to explain certain words, phrases, background perhaps, uh, until they arrived at a single proposition, an individual section of an argument. So the, 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 these were still young kids at the university, sometimes six, 16 years old um, in the arts faculty, were thrown into a Latin text and then it was broken down and so that you could see what an individual part was and how it related to the other parts of the sentences or the paragraph or the page or the full text. So you really were, were sort of shaped into thinking about text and meaning and that's what's exactly what the idea was. So after the exposition, there's uh, important points were emphasized and this was often done in the form of a discussion. And you see in the uh, surviving uh, discussions that they would start, for example, with a phrase like dubium est, it is doubtful, that. Or dubitandum est, it must be doubted. Because when you, have, when you talk about doubt, it's easy to spark a discussion um, rather than when you talk about agreement, then you can only confirm what the other person says. It's not a, not a real back and throwing. So it's always about I disagree. And it was a game. Um, but uh, a really, you know, a lively game because we also have evidence that, and this is a quotation, in the classroom there was clamoring, hissing, making noise, stone throwing by themselves or by their servants and accomplices or in other ways. So this is really uh, an environment where, uh, of course, people argued as a game to learn, but at the same time when you argue, even when it's a game, and you might know this uh, from your home situation when you argue with your spouse, uh, it starts as a game, but it gets very serious very quickly. <laughs> and the same in the, cl in the classroom. So how did the corpus, um, as a physical book, come to support this kind of intellectual approach to Aristotle? So it wasn't really about Aristotle, it was about his texts, and they provided a lot of ammunition for discussion. with very complicated texts, and therefore suitable for this sort of uh, interaction with complicated Latin and trying to make sense of meaning, etc. But we, of course, are talking about the material book. So is there anything in the materiality of these corpus manuscripts that help us sort of confirm this uh, assumption of uh, discussion in the medieval classroom? In other words, is there cultural residue on the page of the <coughs> corpus manuscripts that you can say, ha, ah, this fits in what we know how education at the medieval university occurred? So let's have a look at uh, material object. Um, a very good starting point is this. This is a copy that you may know. It's a quite famous uh, copy of the Corpus Vetusius, um, uh, owned by Henry of Renham at some point. Um, it's a second half, 13th century copy made in England for use in Oxford. Um, I've seen this in the British Library. And I came to the Rich Library to study this uh, corpus manuscript and a few others, uh, thinking, uh, because I hadn't done my research properly, that, very, that it was a very small book. But uh, lo and behold, there was this enormous box put on my desk. And there went my <coughs> argument for saying corpus manuscripts were in the classroom, physically, on the desks of individuals. Because this was a book, and I had it weighed, which caused some uh, confusion in the library, uh, among the library staff, uh, because nobody had asked ever to have a book weighed, and there was no facilities for it. So the book was taken <laughs> to another department, and it was returned to me later in the day. It weighed four and a half kilos. So that's not something you put in your knapsack um, as you happily go to the university in the morning. But we'll get to that in a second. Still, the book says, and this was my uh, reason for thinking that it was uh, in the classroom, that Henry of Renham wrote this book and heard it lectured on in the schools at Oxford. He then uh, emended and glossed what he heard. Um, it's a later hand um, on a page that was inserted later. As you can see, this is a nice second half 13th century uh, script. But here we have a later insertion, and then also an even later, later uh, cursive remark on Henry owning this book, book and have it sort of glossed what he heard. Um, there is indeed a lot of glosses. 
sort of expositions on the physics, which were added to the page, um, but also classroom notes, which are the shorter ones right next to the main text, on the, sorry, right next to, on both, both sides of the main text. Um, that is interesting, because if the book is too large to bring to the classroom, how do these notes get there? And I leave it as a cliffhanger, because we get there in a moment. So I want to highlight four, five, five features of uh, physical features of the manuscript. And what I'll do after is uh, uh, try to, for each feature, see how they came up um, before it was really used as a classroom book, Aristotle, at the university, even before the university was formed, and to see how these features became sort of this amalgam of uh, a package of uh, uh, say, a shape that helps people understand Aristotle in a classroom setting. So there are 71 corpus vetusius, all the corpus um, manuscript that survive. There's another uh, 40 or 50 or so of the new corpus. That is the translation by Muebeck from the 1270s. Uh, but I'm not talking about that at the moment. Not in this paper, anyway. So those 71, um, I put them in a database with the help of two uh, students' assistants, and um, interesting things came out, especially if you also add images from these books, and that's more and more easy because of uh, you know, digitization that now really comes off the ground here uh, in America, but also in, in Europe. And it's going slowly, and you're always dissatisfied because you can't find what you want. But generally speaking, there's always some things that you find, and that was very different 10 years ago. So I'm not complaining about digitization, but you know, could perhaps go a little bit faster. That would be nice. So first feature, um, seen in all 71. Well, it's in the name corpus, so it's multiple texts. So it's a bit unfair. But still, we have to um, deduce this from the existing copies. So the, the one with the least text has nine. The one with the most text has about 25. Um, this is one um, that I'm showing you because it has a, a nice tool, namely uh, Klavieren in Dutch. And what would that be in English, I wonder? It's the tabs on the side that tell you where a new text starts. And at the front, there is a, a list of Aristotle works it holds. And then you can just say, well, this is the, four, the fifth text, and so I need to have the fifth tab. Um, it's a very simple tool, but it shows you then, the physicality shows you, it's a corpus. There's multiple texts inside. This is also part of a larger movement in the 13th century, as pointed out by Malcolm Parks. Um, there's a tendency, starting already in the 12th century, but uh, sort of it, it booms in the 13th century at the universities, <coughs> to put stuff that is on the same topic, or it has this, this works from the same author, or the same theme, Trinity, uh, or perhaps used in the same setting in one book. In the early 12th century, and especially in the 11th century, uh, from my own experience, these things that you see bundled, whatever the contents is, not even Aristotle uh, per se, but other things as well, that are bundled in the 13th century, in the 11th century are usually single, auth uh, thing single uh, manuscripts. So one text for one physical book. That seems to be the normal thing to do in the 11th century. Now, that was also the age when the script was much larger. And so it was very difficult to put a lot of things in one manuscript. Two short texts, perhaps you could, but certainly not nine uh, texts by Aristotle, or 25. That's impossible, unless you have this weird book that's very big. And I have examples of that too, but that's an exception. So a lot of texts in one book, um, which is um, what you see in sermon manuscripts, for example, very popular in the 13th century. Um, topics like, I mentioned it already, the Holy Trinity, uh, works by Aristotle, but also other authors and things um, that are used in a classroom setting. So different authors, but once you see that three of them are uh, used in a classroom, you put, quickly put the other ones there as well, even if you don't know that per se from secondary sources. And this, is, interestingly, is a thing that's being taken over by the vernacular languages. So you see in the 14th century, in Middle Dutch, French, English, that there's also a tendency to start to bring things together. And scribes in the vernacular and this is really what I like about the vernacular. They're very explicit about it. So there's a, there's a few cases in Middle Dutch where scribes say, I'm putting these together because they're all from the same author. Or I'm putting these together because they're all on faith. 
And uh, Latin scribes is sort of real. They're, they're above that. So, you know, we're not going to tell you why this is all together because, of course, you know that. But in, in vernacular, people are really, you know, okay, here, great book. I put it all together for you because it's all about uh, Jacob van Meyerland, which is a Dutch author, for example. The second feature as codecology. Um, is the dimensions. And for this, I threw my 71 manuscript in a database. And um, here's the results. Page dimensions, but then uh, only the height, because the width is a nice 0.7. So we only need the height, don't need the width, because it's, uh, it follows from it. Interesting, then, is that on the lower end, there's only two books that are lower than 200 millimeters in height. And even though we're, a lot of us are talking about portable books, Nobody has ever defined what that is. When does the book start to be, uh, stop being <coughs> portable and, and start being stationary? Um, so if you look at Paris uh, Bibles, the ones that we know were taken on the road by uh, priests and Dominican friars, that's always, that's, I like that, it's a good starting point. They're usually, uh, the, sm the smaller ones and, uh, are around 20 centimeters in height. So that, you know, that's your iPhone. Um, and um, and the, the higher ones are 25. Um, if you then look at um, um, the corpus manuscripts, it's surprising how little, how few very small ones there are. So there's only two that are lower than 200 millimeters in height. And that was the one surprising find I, I had anticipated. And this is actually a story about the British Library. Uh, I went there to look at very tiny uh, corpus manuscripts, and they all turned out to be very large and four and a half kilos. Um, and then the, it goes up to seven, uh, 370 millimeters, which is sort of a larger size monastic uh, codex. Uh, and that, that is actually uh, also surprising to see that large for a corpus manuscript that is used for education. So scholastic manuscripts you can read in secondary sources are strikingly small. And I would have to say, I don't see it confirmed here. The average is 283. If you look at uh, Aristotle, all of them from the 13th century, there's 443 manuscripts, um, then you would have to say, well, there's a lot of them that are uh, uh, lower than 20 centimeters in height, and it um, goes up um, much further, 575, if you see, and the average there is 272. So the previous one, 283 in average, and these are 272. I, this is the corpus without uh, corpus of Aristotle manuscripts without the corpus manuscripts, if you see what I mean, because otherwise you would have weird statistics. That means that corpus manuscripts are larger than the average Aristotle manuscripts, and that is surprising, because it's it's a <coughs> textbook, it's a scholastic manuscript, it's supposed to be on the move. So what's going on? There's another cliffhanger that we go to later. Third um, feature, the manuscript is prepared to contain glosses. Now, there's a difference between manuscripts that have glosses and manuscripts that are prepared for glosses. Manuscripts that have been prepared for glosses may have glosses or not. And manuscripts that have not been prepared for glosses may also have glosses. <laughs> so this is confusing. So for this, we look at the average size of the text block. And then there's a certain number to it that medieval scribes even explicitly said it is like this. They measured it and said four-fifths of, of the width is the total height of the text block and this formula. So you can see, objectively speaking, with these medieval formula, that this text block, and I'm, so you're looking at the main text block in the middle with a P starting with a P, and then there's a, a rim of glosses around it. But if you take those glosses out, because those are the student notes, you end up with something that's only 65, uh, that's 65 percent margin. So 65 percent is left blank. And normally, in, and I've done this also with quantitative codicology, it's between 45 and 50 percent of the page is blank, which is a lot if you think of it. So if this were a blog, I would say half of the books from the Middle Ages are empty. But it's, but it's surprising. Um, 65 percent has, in this case, uh, nothing. But of course, nothing, because it was anticipated that the student wanted to put a lot of notes there. So this is your cultural residue. And this is also where you can say this book was prepared for glossing. I don't care that there are glosses. I care about whether it was prepared to contain glosses. Because it means that somebody, the owner, would tell the scribe and listen. 
Now, don't fill the entire page with text because I have my own things to add as well. OK, well, we'll keep it a little bit more narrow and we'll give you lots of uh, uh, room in the lower margin, which is often a great place to uh, put longer notes. So it's, it's, uh, it's, I hope you see it's a little, a little bit of a different way of looking at this, uh, but it tells you more about the purpose previously to uh, the actual use, how the scribe started to operate based on input of future reader, of the first reader. There's something special going on with the glosses in the Corpus Manuscript. Very clever. Because um, the example you see here has two large margins, left and right, of the main text, an upper margin that's a little bit extended, and a lower margin that's significantly extended. And it's filled with glosses and notes, etc. But what if you have more than one note pertaining to a certain line. You, of course, would start every gloss uh, next to the line to which it refers. Because this is the only way, there's no footnotes yet, this is the only way to make sure that you know that there's something to read in addition to the main text. Because you see, you hover with your eyes, that's something starting right there. That means that that gloss that you see in your right and in your, the corner of your eye is actually pertaining to something you read and so you, you start reading the gloss after if you're reading in that sense with the activating extra thoughts in the margin. But what if you have more than one? Then there's a problem. Well, okay, there's another margin. Whew. So now we have two remarks and you see it actually in examples. Does this work? No. Um, the example, you can see there's examples of uh, glosses starting on the same height, so presumably referring to the same text. So they designed something in case you anticipated that you needed more than two remarks <coughs> on the same uh, line of text. In other words, there was a special design for students who wanted to go really into depth and anticipated that they needed to say a lot about the main text, not just write the occasional note, but quite a, quite a bit. And then we have this design, <coughs> which I find super clever. So we have five tracks, which are indicated with uh, plummet, with pencil where uh, you actually give yourself five opportunities to add something to the text that pertains to the same line, to the same uh, thought or uh, proposition of Aristotle. The fifth one is still empty. So this, uh, th this will be very interesting research that I've not done yet because it requires a lot of reading as well. Um, is there a difference in track? Is there then, can you say that the contents closest to the uh, main texts are notes from my teacher. The second track is me, and the third track is, I don't know, for somebody else or for later, uh, or first reading close to the text, the second time I read it, this, or for this purpose of uh, using Aristotle, close to the text, for that purpose, further from the text. So this is really, really interesting. Maybe if one of the students is inspired to do this, it's a great topic, guys, for a, for a dare I say, PhD. Yes, I dare to say that. <coughs> So how did these notes get here? This is also, this is a different manuscript than we saw before, but it's huge. It's uh, 35 centimeters in height, not something you take with you, and very fat as well, obviously, because the, all these texts had to go in, and room for margin. So there's lots of um, uh, redundant space around Aristotle, which made the volume much fatter. Um, there is references to notes, physical things. There's a, there's a nice pseudo-Boethius uh, handbook for students um, from the 1230s in Paris. We have a few copies. And it says, um, when you go to your class, you bring with you scraps of parchment or wax tablets. So these things then transported thoughts, um, remarks of your teacher, your own thoughts, other people's thoughts. And you brought them home. And I think this is how we can explain large manuscripts too large to really transport, being filled with copious notes. You would then write it in your margin next to the text to which it pertains. And lo and behold, two years ago in Leiden, I found one. So this was stuck in the binding, um, but had previously been folded. You can still see the fold on the right-hand side, uh, sort of clipped in the, in the choir, and then it sits, sits next to the text uh, to which it uh, refers. And this is a, a, a few uh, scholastic works in the manuscript, including, as the first text, the Pseudo-Boethius, 
that tells you to do this. So this is a student that actually first read, how do I study? And now I know it's study. OK, now I'm going to study. And uh, oh yeah, I have to slip my notes into uh, the book. And so let's just do that. And so there's three of these notes um, in this particular manuscript. They were labeled as fragments. You, would, you could see why that happened. But it's actually not a fragment, because it's a complete thing. It just has a very peculiar shape, because it's an offcut. It's a piece of parchment from the blue recycling bin. Then page design, my fourth feature. So we have a little bit, you know, one or two columns, depending on the size of the manuscript. Because if the manuscript is really large, one column does not suffice. Because as the psychologi psychology of reading uh, predicts that if you have too many words, more than 15 on one line, it gets very difficult to read and then jump to the next line. This is when you sometimes get an email that's out of whack and it just keeps on going. It's very hard. The first, one, first line to second line is possible, but then second to third gets really difficult. So it's normal then to bring down the number of words per column by just adding another column. So the number of columns I don't think is significant for corpus manuscripts. It just varies as a general principle of medieval book production with the size of the page. So when you see something like this, um, it's not unusual, um, even though it's different from the previous example I gave you for corpus manuscript. It does show you, however, uh, well, for one thing, it shows you more tracks, because it's the same manuscript with five. But also, it shows you in the upper margin one of the new types of running titles, namely running title that gives the entire uh, name of the text, um, <coughs> book three of the anima. And as you can see on the left page, that you can still see a little bit of the book opening, it's the same running title on that side. So this is a type one running title in my database. It's repeat the same thing on verso and recto. There's also a type two running title where uh, text uh, names are split into two. And the first half is on uh, left verso and the second half on right recto, C of a book opening. That's even clever then. That's more clever. Um, this is actually an older copy that imitates sort of the, the uh, Liber Primus, Liber Primus of the older 12th century copies. But they get then to the next stage, which is to reduce the, the number of infor the, the information in the top line by splitting into two. And you still have, because you always have an open book, otherwise you don't, can't read it, and uh, you still have the full title. So a new type of uh, running title that uh, uh, starts to become um, encountered in these manuscripts. There's another interesting thing that is the paragraphs. This is not me uh, deducing it. It's the, the Rouses have first drawn attention to this, that the paragraphs actually red, blue, red, blue. There's a red one missing. Um, so to indicate the individual lectio parts. So these are the smallest, uh, boiled down to the smallest part of not the sentence, but meaning. And therefore, sometimes you have a longer passage if you need a few lines. It can also be a few words. So it's basically you read from blue, from red to blue, and then you stop. And then you read from blue to red the next time, and then from red to blue. Very clever, smart, and custom tailored towards its particular use. Namely, you need to read a little bit, and then you look up. Um, because, of course, uh, in some cases, there were these books on the table, but at least uh, also at home when you take your notes, you have different notes for different passages. And now you can keep track of where the break was. So you don't have to remember or write down uh, where the break was, but it's a standard break. This is another interesting thing that one should look at. Um, uh, corpus manuscripts, do they have the same breaks everywhere? It would be really interesting. So if they are from the same university, same age, are the breaks the same? And do the breaks vary over time? Is there a, uh, a difference then in how Aristotle was taught at the medieval university? So there's another dissertation right there. <laughs> and a fifth um, element is the birth of the footnote. So these are uh, nice uh, footnotes because they're very handy, um, because they have unique links between text. And look at the colors, red. A blue and orange are all giving you a unique um, reference mark, footnote, uh, signe de renvoi, whatever you want to call it. Um, it varied usually with circles and lines in various positions, two circles, three circles, one line, two lines, one circle, circle in the middle, two lines on the side. Make up your own system, um, but it, it helps you to refer to something 
uh, that is only one thing, the margin. And there's examples of earlier manuscripts around 1200. There's a very nice one uh, in Philadelphia that actually has three times the same footnote on the same page. So it has a triple dot for all the footnotes and a triple dot four or five times in the main text. <coughs> that is hell, of course, because which refers to which? Well, presumably people knew it a little bit, um, but uh, it's not, not so efficient as this particular system, which we still have now. That's how efficient it is. So these are um, five features. There's more, but these are five very speaking one and ones, and um, to make my point, that ultimately present a package of features, and you see how useful features they were for students um, in a scholastic environment that you find all over Europe in the corpus manuscripts. And here's just three examples, France, England, and Germany. It's very, you know, now you know but it's, they're the same manuscript. You don't have to measure even, right? It's the enlarged uh, margins, the, the, the paragraphs, and even the, the whole feel of the book is the same. And also for uh, the true codicologists <coughs> among you, you, s you see that the width, except for the one in the middle, is a little bit, it's a little bit too wide. And the, the average is 0.72. It's actually on the higher side of what's average in the Middle Ages. So it feels a little bit too broad, it is a little bit too broad. So that's, um, um, a format that uh, was likely started in Paris because that's where the corpus manuscripts first emerge. But everything that I have in my database from 1250 onwards basically has this format. Before that, it's a little bit of a mess, and I'll, I'll briefly speak about it in a moment. But after 1250, this seems to be the format for corpus manuscripts at university. And interesting, because it was so um, very useful, it also started to be exported, not just across Europe geographically, but also to other faculties. So here's a good example of uh, an Articella manuscript, The Little Arts of Medicine, um, standard text in the um, Faculty of Medicine. And you see that actually you're looking at a, you're looking at a corpus manuscript, except it's medical text um, in, the same, in the same fashion. Ultimately, um, uh, it's also exported to other formats, for example, the Bible. And here's a good example of um, all the things that were new on the page. So this is a Bible manuscript circa 1300. And here you have uh, all the reading aids um, and an extended margin, whereas an interesting also all sorts of theme words are placed. So for quick, quick reading, I don't need that, don't need that, yes, I need this. So it's not reading from cover to cover, as you would still in the classroom uh, in mm -hmm. the monastic school, but it's to pick and choose what you want and f quickly find it. And it's still our present format hasn't changed. Just like Gutenberg didn't change anything when he started to print books. This is a copycat. Very briefly, how did it come to be this way? So how do we move from the format on the left to the format on the right? Now, um, I looked at this and I sampled them and I looked at a few features. I shan't bore you with this particular graph, but I just want to highlight a few things, namely the same features um, that I mentioned before. First, um, the type of book, and I already mentioned this, is not a corpus manuscript. <coughs> so Aristotle, pre-university, are usually manuscripts with one text. One text, one book. As you would in the age. So it's also reflective of the age, but it's also reflective of the fact that there's no need yet to break with this tradition, because the university and the demand for having multiple texts with you, or at least in the vicinity of your learning experience, wasn't there yet. If you look at 12th century Aristotle manuscripts, there's 60 that survive. Um, they are smaller and they are larger. But the average is 234, which is significantly smaller than the 283 of the corpus manuscripts and also of the 272 of the 13th century Aristotle manuscripts. So Aristotle manuscripts in general gain in size in the 13th century, and those that are corpus manuscripts gain in size extra. So. About uh, codicology, the extended margins, so a very important um, feature, so actually you see emerge in, in my uh, data set, and I have quite a bit of um, data on Aristotle manuscripts, in the late 12th century. So here we get manuscripts that actually show you that there was an effort made, made to extend the margins. So sometimes you see larger margins, but it's not really clear, it's just a little bit larger, but the image on the left here 
uh, from a Bloomsbury auction, uh, I don't know where the book currently is, um, shows you actually the margins are extended also on the inside, close to the heart of the book. And that is a rule of thumb for my, I will, a rule of thumb for my students, literally, if you can put your thumb in there and you don't miss any text, uh, then it means that the inner margin was extended. And that is often an indication that people want to add stuff to the page in addition to the main text. It's a nice rule of thumb, I find. Um, and the other one uh, from the Bodleian is uh, same age and same deal, actually. The other feature, and I haven't talked about it explicitly, but you may have seen it, is that there's a lot of space between the lines in the corpus manuscript. So it allows you to have very brief glosses over the text, expanding, for example, uh, abbreviations or uh, explaining certain words. This is something you also find uh, emerging well before the corpus manuscript become established in the middle of the 13th century, um, around 1200 in the, in the first quarter of the 13th century. So this is the earliest one I could find uh, that is in, uh, uh, filled with Aristotle works. There's some other ones that are a little bit earlier that are not Aristotle, but here you see the enlarged space between the lines and um, it's, it's you, you can feel it, it's on its way to becoming corpus, but it's not really yet. It's, it's not, it doesn't have that heavy, dark feel that it's also, it seems that the ink is darker as well. The nice digital humanities project, by the way, is the ink of corpus manuscripts darker than others. I, I think it is, and that might have to do with clarity and quick access, but we have to measure it first. So, corpus manuscripts borrow features that we're wondering about in book culture that slowly even enter the domain of Aristotle manuscripts, but it's until the 1250s, it takes until the 1250s that all these package, this whole package is complete and all these features are now standard uh, size. And just to give you um, um, uh, but some general conclusions to this, I think we can say that corpus manuscripts show the strong relationship between use and um, physical features. I think it's a very good uh, thing to show students that, that it works this way. And it's so clear from the reading aids that are brought to the page because they're so clearly connected to what university students wanted. Um, corpus manuscripts um, also are interesting because we know that the new corpus of Moorbeke is actually, I'm going to show, yeah, here. Um, the Moorbeke uh, texts of the new corpus, starting in the 1270s, are uh, available in the Pekia system. And we'll, we'll, hoard, we'll listen to the next speaker uh, talk about Pekia, but it's an efficient way um, to provide copies of uh, a text that is sort of uh, has a quality stamp on it. This is the correct text and can be disseminated through the university environment. Uh, but here we see <coughs> um, evidence that Aristotle was used in the Pekia system, in this case commentaries, but um, the new corpus of Aristotle manuscripts actually circulated in Paris in two different um, Pekia tr <coughs> traditions. So I haven't found any evidence of the old corpus being disseminated so professionally and um, with supervision through the Pekia system, but I think it might just be the case that we would have to conclude that that might just be a very good possibility because it might also account for the fact that these manuscripts look so alike. If there is one source you have to go back to because it's the original approved source, that's also uh, a good way of explaining why these manuscripts so quickly uh, were having the same form, were giving the same format. And so there's something to uh, be looked in yet, but um, um, something I want to do. Um, the other uh, thing that's very clear is that the 12th century Aristotle is very different from the 13th century Aristotle, and that this is related to how it became predominantly used, education, but I would just want to highlight there is also other manuscripts of Aristotle in the 13th century that are not in the corpus format. So it's not that the other format died, it's that the new format is just coming into rise in this certain setting that we focused on. The last thing, conclusion, is sort of a general conclusion that 
there is a common thread in all these novelties that you see in the production of Aristotle manuscripts. And it basically boils down to a term that is coined by some modern book historians called book fluency. And that is the ability to read a text quickly and accurately. So it's about speed, and many of the reading aids are about speed, and it's about understanding, for example, the paragraph marks. So you see that, in that sense, Aristotle manuscripts in the university are also appealing to a new way of producing manuscripts, a format that emerged from the 12th century Renaissance, where scholars needed to have quick access to information that was complex, and therefore were given extra tools to uh, make them understand the text better. Thank you very much. Hi, this is great. Um, is this on? Yeah, it's just for the film. I see, OK. Um, I think it's a really, really great reminder to us, or really important thing for us to keep in mind that these medieval books are tools that are created to be used uh, for a specific purpose. But I'm still a little bit clear with, uh, unclear with the, uh, with the Wetius, with the Wetustius uh, evidence that we've pre been presented as to exactly how these, uh, these marginalia are used. If we try to remind ourselves about the psychology of the undergraduate, the undergraduate, while he's taking notes, is thinking, OK, what is going to be on the exam? What is going to be on the quiz? How do I study for the quiz? Um, so I'm trying to imagine what these medieval students of Aristotle in the, this liberal arts, um, in this <laughs> liberal arts education, are actually thinking when they're taking these notes. What is it that they're preparing their, themselves for? I assume it's for um, it's for the classroom debate, right? That's what that's what they're well, evaluated on. Yeah. Well, right? to have a to really have a good answer, you need to read them. That's what uh, I, and, and that's what and I'm they're asking. Extremely difficult to read because it's highly abbreviated, uh, no mm -hmm. to script. So it's not something you can sit down uh, usually and do very quickly. In addition to, for example, the codicological research when mm -hmm. you're in a library, uh, you can take pictures and do it at home. But um, generally, I separate those two discussions. Mm -hmm. um, we do know, though, however, that it's a reflection of the lectures, mm -hmm. as well as um, additions from the students' head. So reflections of the student on the material. But also, as I showed you in the, the one from Renham, there might be formal commentaries in the margin as well. So uh, Aquinas was in the margin of Renham's copy. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a battery of um, sort of voices surrounding the main text, explaining it, um, taking it to the next level. That sounds still a little bit vague. Um, but to get it more concrete, we need a good study of the actual contents of these, um, of these glosses. But it, am, I, am, I right to, am I right to think that most likely what these students are preparing themselves for is for the disputatio? That, yes, yeah, yeah. It's, the it's for, the, for their own input in, in the debate mm -hmm. in, the, in the class and also outside the classroom. And it's also to register what happened in the public debates of their, for, of their masters. So and a, they don't necessarily know what disputatio their professor is going to pose to them, right? It could be, it could be virtually no, it, anything yeah. to do with the text. Well, it varied from university to university and professor to professor, yeah. So, um, but you have to understand, I'm, I'm merely a book historian. Yeah. <laughs> um, by looking at these things textually, I'm doing already more than I'm supposed to do. Uh, so, so, so we need, we really need somebody with, with good understanding of the, of sort of the topics of discussion as well, um, to make sense of the glosses. One more, uh, one more question because you, you brought it up uh, really briefly. Is there a standard? Um, gloss for the for the Corpus Vetustius. Well, this uh, Aquinas, no, not of the Corpus Vetustius, but of individual Aristotle texts. Right. So that's why Aquinas is in one uh, of the texts because he wrote a commentary on that specific one. Cool. So there's not because the Corpus is not one Corpus. It's a little bit of a deceptive name because it's sometimes nine, sometimes ten, twelve. There's actually no two manuscripts in the seventy-one that I'm studying that have exactly the same text in the same order, which is also very interesting. I just want to add, not having read all the glosses, but having read some in theological manuscripts and thinking about the cost of the manuscript, 
probably most of these were prepared for people who were unusual among the students in that they intended to go on at least to a degree mm -hmm. uh, and or were wealthy. Uh, there's a comment in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales when he dis first describes the scholar of Oxford, known as the clerk of Oxford, saying he had these wonderful book, this wonderful book of Aristotle with these huge, empty margins. Mm -hmm. Gladly would he learn and gladly teach, right? So obviously he hasn't learned yet is the implication. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that was wonderful. And you brought up uh, something that I think about kind of frequently, which is that I would like somebody to write a book on the history of blank spaces. Um, because in Roman antiquity, at least, they oftentimes had uh, walls. And the perception today is that those walls should stay blank and painted, right? Because that is, mm -hmm. um, as we look around here, the expectation. But Romans expected people to put graffiti all over them. Uh, the expectation was always that um, blank walls in Pompeii or Herculaneum for instance, would be filled with graffiti. And I guess, could you speak a little bit more about the expectations that go into the provision of blank space in books and whether we as modern readers are projecting our own idea that when I see people writing in books in libraries, I want to hurt them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and whether that's incorrect, and whether we are projecting our expectations of blank space and books mm -hmm. onto medieval readers when we shouldn't be. Yes, good question. The, um, well, it's obvious for the corpus manuscript, they were designed to be written in. Yeah. Because the, ma the main text, text size is too small, too narrow, too low. Um, so there, it was anticipated from the very perception of the book that it would have been copied in, even post-production. So it's even more interesting in this uh, respect is to look at manuscripts that were not. So that do not have extended margins. In what cases do we see something written there? And what's the nature of those glosses? And then you would get a sense of books that were not designed because there was a moment that the scribe started and could have designed it so that there were uh, larger margins. In other words, i.e., um, that the reader had said to him, extend. So this reader did not say extend, so did not plan to write anything in it, at least not substantial text. So if there is writing in it by contemporary hands, perhaps the first reader, what did this person write down? Um, from what I've seen, even, even the most beautiful books, but that might also be projection for me in the 21st century, uh, the most beautiful medieval manuscripts may still have glosses. In fact, the Lindisfarne Gospel is riddled with them, uh, Anglo-Saxon 10th century. But um, so I think anything is possible is the short answer. Yeah. Um, what another category of, of glosses that are interesting is books that hardly have anything, but that do have something. So if a reader did not plan to gloss, and in fact never glossed, or hardly anything, uh, hardly ever glossed, if he did gloss, what did he gloss? So that's really interesting. And uh, it's not something we normally uh, go to because we go to the gloss books when we want to stu study glossing, but you should go to the unglossed ones. And then you get, a, I think, a real good sense of what's going on. Great. So that helps a bit. Yeah. Uh, professor, I thought this was a really great lecture. Thank you. I have a question about the locales in which these books were used, because you showed us examples of these manuscripts from Italy, from Germany, England, France, and all from roughly around the same time. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm wondering, you know, and this feeds into your discussion, I think, of the cultural residue, how did this new pattern come to become sort of the, the yeah. continental standard? Yeah. And we have these images of the, the, the traveling scholar, you know, the, the master who earns his degree in one place and goes to another, and I'm wondering if maybe that's what brought the new format into popularity, or, or how did this happen on such a wide scale at roughly the same time? Yeah. So what we need to do, it's actually what I proposed to in, in the project, but it wasn't funded, um, is to put all the, all the manuscripts that we have from this period, not just Aristotle, but everything from the university, in a one large database. Date them really precisely so that you know which ones are the oldest ones and see how the younger ones relate to the older ones. 
Do they have the same text? If they have multiple texts, is it in the same order? If there is a division system with paragraphs, is it the same or different? And where, and then you cluster them. So where are the ones that are similar from? Are they from Paris? Because you can see when a manuscript is from France and Paris is the most likely place. You can see when it's Germany or Italy. Um, so that we need to do that. So th there's no answer at the moment because we haven't looked at it. If there is evidence for uh, corpus, the old corpus uh, being produced in the Pecchia system, then I think we have a good case for thinking, uh, for explaining why these books look so similarly. Because then at least in one university, you may assume they will have uh, been from the same exemplar and therefore it's likely that also the format was copied onto the new manuscript. Um, then you have traveling students and then it's very easy. Follow the, see if you have something in that format with that division in places, uh, in manuscripts that are known to be made in different places. So if, you, if, you, if there is a Paris presentation of Aristotle, certain texts, for example, with the paragraphs, um, then look if you have that same division in the manuscript that was from Bologna or Oxford. And then you have a good sense of uh, physical movement of a book that must have happened then because there was no telephone, Facebook, etc. So a thing must have moved. Um, and, and that's what you will see. Because we know also from other um, manuscript medical books, I've been looking at medical manuscripts quite a bit, and uh, there's also a lot of movement of these texts across Europe. Um, we, can, we can track this, we have the uh, tools for it and the digital means, but we need some money as well to do this. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderful lecture and even that answer. And um, you have that wonderfully materialist reading of the long, narrow format, holding it in the hand, uh, which seems so convincing. I wonder, do you have evidence in your database that those were not bound when they were used or oh. bound in the vellum? Yes. And then, given that proportion and your really convincing case, ah, this is the student, this is the teacher mm -hmm. walking around in a room and holding it in a hand. How do you read the material structure that you then graft in the other ones? Is that a desk-bound copy or do, or do you have a materialist yep, um, claim to make out yep, of that? Yep. Um, generally speaking, in the medieval university classroom, books were placed on a desk. You see this in the visual evidence and also from, we know that certain copies were made for teachers and by teachers, and they're too heavy to, to it, it makes sense in the binding and the, the width of the page that they were on a desk. Uh, but I'm very happy that you asked that uh, first part of the question because, in fact, yes, those narrow books, when they're larger, so there's a, there's a category of narrow books that have all the makeup of, of being a, a copy of a, of a teacher, it has the et, uh, et est, uh, glosses, etc., explaining little things, except they're very thick. But if you look at the code ecology, and the dirt on the page and the break of the choirs, you can see that they're actually in three or four or five pieces. There's a wonderful one, the Harley collection in the British Library has 12 pieces, mm -hmm. which means you can leave what you don't need in your room and you only come to class with that little part that you do. Now, I, I do it myself as well. A halfway term, my folder for a specific class is too big. I throw the first half of the stuff out, all the discussion questions in the first half, and I go to, uh, to my class lighter. The other thing is that there's good evidence for uh, these books not being bound. Um, all of them are bound later, and many cases where you have a, a 17th century binding, for example, you can see there's no other punching holes for, the, um, for a previous binding, not a proper binding anyway. They might have been tacketed, or, or those parts may have been put together in another sense, for example, with a, uh, just with a wrapper, or just simply loose on a shelf is also possible. So that. Uh, bindingless, being bindingless, and with uh, out the things that you don't need, made it light. But also, I think induced induced the uh, easy handling, handling and the curly uh, curling of the pages. Yeah. So in some, yes, there is good codicological evidence for that. Thanks. Speaking of manuscripts being rebound. There was one that you showed that had extra binding holes on the other side of the page. I scribbled down the shelf mark, but now I can't read my writing. It's something oh. 833. Oh, that's the Sangal one. The Sangal one, yeah. Yeah. So. This one. Oops. Le on the left. Yep, exactly. Can you explain that? Where's the binding holes? On the, on the left hand side. It's very tiny on my screen. Oh. They're brick marks for ruling? Yeah. Okay. It looks oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the ruling pattern. Okay. Yeah. I, I 
had a question about those print marks because they, they are just on the left hand. They're on the outer margin, so mm -hmm. they're like ruling two. Yeah, this is the continental so practice. The In England, they yeah. have four sets of prick, well, four uh, rows of prickings when an open book, and in, in Europe they have two. Continental Europe, they have two, I should say. Uh, thank you. I have a question about the margin itself because, let's say, uh, I can think of another type of text with a small text block and a large margin, mm -hmm. which would be, let's say, a, a Mishnah, a Torah commentary, where the margin is not serving as an opportunity, like this, these margins are serving as a space for learning and, yeah. and teaching. Yeah. Um, but let's say in the Mishnah, you have first a hierarchy of glosses with Rashi and, and so on, with a standard arrangement. And um, here, there's something seemingly kind of bold about putting your ideas at the same level as the text is sort of, um, mm -hmm. and also the, just that it, it's all horizontal and sort yes. of aligned. Even, yeah. yeah. So I guess that's the observation. I wonder what, Thank how you, you would respond that to that. Useful, yeah. So maybe the margin can't tell the story by itself, is what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sarah's right, of course, about the margins. It needs a good study. Yeah. We, we can call it void or something. Well, the, I mean, people I have. Obviously, yeah. compare everything to a papyrus or a stone, but you see a lot of these notations on papyri mm -hmm. in terms of, like, on the margin. So I think it's not just medieval. Yeah. I think it would Notice, be very, yeah, that's very what, cool to do a yeah. history of that's what I mean as well. Yeah. So cross uh, cultures and yeah. time periods. Yeah, really useful. I think people have done that. They, there are people that have written about the his the blank yeah, spaces but in, in. Yeah, but what you need is like quantifiable. Because yeah. they data, mean something so. different, like Marina's documents. That's about luxury and like mm -hmm. I can afford all this yeah. Neil, I material. In his book on soundscapes in Florence, he talks about these big empty piazzas mm -hmm. as opportunities for reverberation, sonic. Uh, sonic space. But, but even the, so I wrote a little piece for a catalog in Philadelphia, an exhibition last year. Um, there is, I had to deduce how large margins were on average in manuscripts of the 13th century. There's no data. So we have data for size of manuscripts. But we don't have anybody saying, okay, this is the size of the manuscripts, this is the size of the text block, and we subtract that in the formula, and this is the average not there, say, no text. But you could do that, like I know in the, the Manoscritti Datati catalogs or the Italian catalogers will make full measurements across the page, and mm -hmm. they're trying to describe this is the width of the column. Yeah. But you can, you, maybe there's a data, w you know, a data processing way. To of get that out. Just yeah. taking all of that and saying, well, they're also giving me the page width, so mm -hmm. I just take this other, you yeah. know, you make equation out yeah, of I've it. Yeah, I've done it manually, but then it gets very tiring after. But maybe the there's a way of tapping into, you know, existing catalogs that already have yeah. that codicological information. Yes. I know in Italy. Well, if those data manuscripts would ever be digitized and uh, with metadata, that would be s quite something. The Manuscritti Datati has some s some information that's mm -hmm. that's online and yeah. at, but in terms of metadata being open access, I'm not sure. Thank you. You've shown very clearly and persuasively why people are using Aristotle in the classrooms, how the material format reflects the classroom usage. And it makes me wonder uh, why, how else is Aristotle being transmitted in this period and mm -hmm. why? Yeah. Because now that uh, you're so focused on the educational That's setting. why I had this concluding note that yeah. there's also other ones, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be really nice too. Well, you can see it in the, the lineup of the size that there is things far smaller and larger than what you would expect in corpus manuscripts. So that is, those are ones that are not made for classroom use, presumably. Um, so what do they look like? Yeah, be really interesting. Just a quick observation, really. Uh, I, I'm sitting, listening to your presentation from the perspective of the paper maker, and I've always been very interested and why early European papers had a certain proportion, certain mm -hmm. size. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be the 0 0.7 ratio for the size of the sheet, the early sheet. So my question was, well, did they get the, where did they get this from? Because they can make a paper making mold any size they yeah. want to. Did they get it from the Arab paper makers? Well, sure enough, if you look at standard Arab paper sizes, they also carry the same ratio, mm -hmm. which turns out to be 
the same ratio of, uh, that you get in a rectangle that you cut out of a piece of sheepskin or calf skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is all coming out of the dimensions of the s maximum rectangle you can get off the skin of mm -hmm. an animal, I think. Yeah. And it's, as you suggested, uh, in Europe now, the standard book format goes all the way back pro probably to, to that. That's why we ended up where we're at. I, yeah. I mean, it's partly tradition as well, but. It's, it's also something else. Uh, 0.7 wide is the only relative dimensions that if you fold it, it's 1 by 0.7. And if you fold it again, it's 1 by 0.7. Exactly. Yeah. So you can make smaller books right. by not having to cut anything right. off. Yeah. Right. Which you wouldn't want to do. You wouldn't, no. wouldn't want to, want to keep it. everything, keep the whole sheep. Thank you. Um, so I'm interested in these taller, narrower books because your argument was so convincing. Why don't we have more of them? Uh, yeah, people thought it was weird. I mean, there's, I, there's more evidence that I showed you that it was not supposed to happen. Um, but you know, it did happen. Why not? Well, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there was. Well, you, you suggested earlier that this format is conducive to the oral presentation, to the walking around, and it does make a lot of sense. I think as Shannon Wilcox was saying, it does sit, it fit in the hand. You can hold it, the whole thing, a big book, with one instead of two hands. But then if you have more and more students who have a desk, and, and, and a larger, the tall, the tall one doesn't fit on the desk as well as, because uh, that's probably the same piece of skin if you imagine that same folio folded the other way yeah. makes yeah. this tall book. So yeah. you can have it either way, but yeah. practically speaking, yeah. it begins to make more sense. You know, th th there's a little bit of, um, they are there. It's just that we've never identified them as special. Because if you go to British Library catalog of illuminated manuscripts, you type in of it, and you, and you can find it to 11 to 1100, 1200. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them are. Um, Cicero's, Horace's. So, so they are there. It's just that we've never, I think, registered that they were special. That it's part of the explanation, perhaps. It was really difficult to get a random sample once I knew it was the Ovids, etc., and the Senecas. To still say, okay, I'm not going to look for offits, you know, to get a random sample of what was in there. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, my question is based around where we see these school texts used after their initial reader. Um, by virtue of the fact that these have come down to us, obviously they survived their initial reader, their, the initial note taker. Does the marginalia show that we would have subsequent students also taking additional notes therein? Do these get deposited in libraries pretty quickly thereafter? Um, what, is the, what does it look like after the life of the initial student? Yeah, uh, short answer is yes. There are second, third, fourth generation of students all the way up to the 15th century. This book here is uh, standard corpus, second half 13th century, um, with notes by a student who says he's in Leipzig in 1437 and he puts all his classes, uh, lists all his classes he's following. Um, this is one reason why we don't have so many corpus manuscripts in the 14th century, because they're all in the second-hand book market. Just like we don't have any Paris, but hardly have any Paris Bibles, which were so popular in the 13th century, that, this, that they, the, the second-hand book market is flowing over with them in the 14th century. So um, second-hand books is another uh, highly underappreciated study topic. Every medieval manuscript was a second-hand book in its lifetime in the medieval period, multiple times. So yes, um, and this is evidenced then by, by uh, various layers. You can peel the layers off, oldest layer. And usually, interesting, it seems that it was close to the text study, oldest layers, and you move out uh, and then go, go further into time, which makes sense. Thank you. Yep. I would never buy one of those books, of course, because somebody has written in it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if I could comment on that, because um, Sarah made, that really good, made a really good comment about our expectations that we bring to the text. And I almost wonder if one way for us to think about these medieval textbooks is as, is as a notebook that has the textbook in it, right? If you get your pekia, you have to copy it out, and that those are your those are your notes that well, you was, he mentioned the parchment scraps and, and many other pieces of papers. I think in part, but it's not exactly what we would consider a notebook because they have scrap pieces of paper and notebooks that they're writing in as in addition. Because it's so heavy, you can't take it you can't take it to class. 
There's a, there's a lovely article by uh, Charles Burnett, uh, Give Him the White Cows, <laughs> which lots of the things I talked about is referred to and uh, the practices of making notes, etc. And one of the things he mentioned is a 13th, 13th century uh, bag of a student with pockets for these long strips of parchment. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Charles, Burnett. Charles Burnett, give him the white cows. I have it here on my computer if you're interested. I think. You have to think these are much more expensive. Generally. Of course. Um, I once had a student who was failing my class who told me very proudly that he'd gone to the bookstore and gotten a used copy of the textbook that already had all the highlighting in it. So <laughs> <well going ahead. laughs> I asked him, how do you know that the previous owner had been an A, an a student yeah. or an F student? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Oh, that's a great ending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.